Hello and welcome to Irresistible You. I'm your host, Karen Seltz, and I am beyond excited. Oh my gatos. My good friend, John Pepper, is with us tonight. And John is somebody I met in my Dr. Joe Dispenza meditation group. And every time we have a meditation, he and I go on these tangents, not during the meditation, but after or before. And we cover all these subjects that expand my mind. And I've said to him and to his wife and to all these people that John thinks differently than anybody I've ever met. So I asked him, I got this intuitive hit, hey, John, you want to be on my TV show? And of course, he said, yes, hell yes. I mean, heck yes. (laughs) (laughs) And I love that about John. So we are going to, who knows what we're going to talk about. It's going to be really fun. So hold on to your seats. So the first thing that John wanted to talk about was now, but I would love to start with before now and have you share a little bit about what brought you to this place of looking for meditations. And I'm just going to stop there. I'll let you fill in the blanks. Yeah. So probably about three, four years ago, I gave myself the gift of illness and um, it forced me to confront myself and reality for the first time. And it was the greatest thing that could have ever possibly happened to me. I don't know what I was doing with life before, but I finally feel like I'm alive, finally found myself. And I finally found like a passion and a real excitement in in the idea of consciousness and what reality is in and of itself. I feel like a lot of us just kind of like wake up at 40 and we're all running, looking at everyone else in like a marathon. And then the illness caused me to stop and be like, wait, like, where are we running to? What's, what's going on here? Um, And thanks to Dr. Joe, who I found first, I was able to heal myself very quickly. I understood through meditation that I gave myself the illness, undid it quickly. The doctors were amazed, but um, I figured out what had happened. So, and basically ever since then, I've just been hungry for more and more information on what consciousness is, what reality is and dabbling and, and meditating in all sorts of different practices, Eastern, Western, new age, spirituality, quantum physics, you name it, I've been into it. And uh, it's one of my favorite things to discuss. So thanks for having me here. Yes, you're welcome. I love that. And I love your perspective that you gave yourself the gift of an illness. So explain that a little bit further for, and here's where I don't like to go. People that get into or onto a spiritual path Many of them say, this is my fault. I gave myself this illness. It's my fault. And they blame and shame themselves. And I don't hear any of that when you speak. So tell me your perspective on why it's a gift and the way that you are being responsible for it in a non-shaming, non-guilting way. So I feel like my my perspective is constantly shifting, which is really exciting, like the lens through which I'm viewing reality. Where I'm at right now, I can see that consciousness or thought pattern is almost like a trail. The more you think the same thoughts, the more you think the same thoughts, and you kind of create like a gutter that the thoughts just quickly and easily run through. And I see illness as a huge gift because it like drops a stone in the path that you've been going down or the gutter you've been rolling your thoughts down for years if not decades and it forces you maybe in panic or fear or whatever which all turns irrelevant it forces you to like look a different direction and it forced me to look a different direction and that's why i see it as as the greatest gift it's like a way to shake things up and um I'm sure some people are able to be their own catalyst in looking for a different way, but huge life changes from the perspective I'm at now are the gifts that, that like force the change that I was already asking for um, because the the ravine was getting so deep pretty soon there was going to be no way out. Yeah. I love that so much. So now walk us through, I don't know, like what lights you up now? I know so many things, but just pick something. So many things. My my core starting point that I love to jump off from is the idea of now, because quantum physics and basically every spiritual person, Eastern and Western, who I've studied, suggests this idea that time is an illusion and it boils down to every now being an independent, like isolated 
frame, almost like a film strip where it's an independent frame and you can splice them however you want to. Um, and it kind of gives uh, maybe a more full perspective every second to be like, if I'm on a path I don't like, I have a fresh start right now. I have a fresh start right now. So if something went away I didn't prefer with a person or with an experience or something in my past, it's a fresh start right now. And no matter how many times I fall back into the idea of being a victim or something in my past affecting where I can go in the future, I can jump into the now and be like, it's a clean start right now. Where do we want to go from this point forward? And it makes such a clean, easy break from those those thought gutters of being a victim or being traumatized in the past, which are perfectly valid experiences. They're just no longer my choice of experience to relive or, or go towards in the future. Oh, that's really beautiful. So tell me, how do you catch yourself when you start going down a path that is not your preference? How do you catch it and then get course correct? The meditation I've seen or from my meditation, I've been able to gain greater perspective. I see why so many people recommend it. I kind of see the mind like a wheel or like an old computer, something that like sp spins up and gets going really fast. I don't know if you remember with old computers when the processing speed was kind of slow, you'd click the mouse and it would take a while for the computer to catch up with the clicks. So there'd be like a backlog of stuff that had to be executed or the same thing with the wheel. Like you spin it really fast and it takes a while for it to start to slow down. So the meditation is a way you stop injecting thoughts and it allows the mind to simmer down to a neutral point. And the more time you spend at neutral, the easier it becomes when you're out and about in your day to observe yourself and observe the thoughts when they start up and start falling in ruts and things like that. And um, probably three or so years now I've been meditating very consistently and it just keeps getting easier and easier to the point some days where I just almost laugh all day because I'm so excited and so happy that I'm able to constantly sit in the seat of awareness, see the thought arise, be like, no, thanks. That emotion and thought is no longer in my future and pivot exactly where I know I'm going in thought and emotion. Oh, that's such a great explanation. And Carrie said in the comments, the same thing, like what a great explanation. I love that. How long did it take you consistently meditating before you noticed a big difference in being able to catch things and then shift to a different perspective? For me, it, it's probably been the last year where I've really started seeing some fruit. And every day I feel like it's the best day of my life because I see more and more sense of awareness. Um, it's fun talking to a lot of people and seeing everyone's time frame is different. Some people have extreme experiences in narrow shorts of time in terms of expanding consciousness and having experiences which give them a knowing that this is is not all there is to consciousness and, and life. But for me, I guess it was more of a gradual process. And I think that's one of the reasons I gravitate towards Dr. Joe. He seems kind of like a smart average guy who just did the work, as he said, and proved that anyone who has like a real interest and excitement can can get into it and take it pretty far. And it seems like he's really taking it far from there. Yeah. I, I love that perspective too, like a smart average guy. And one thing that I love about Dr. Joe, you and I discussed this before, but is that he doesn't talk down to anyone. He treats everyone like they are geniuses. And yes, he'll say things several different ways to make sure people are getting it. And he has them of course, repeat it back. And I love that this is available to everyone. And I'm a good story of that because I was clinically depressed. I was suicidal and I've been able to get off all the antidepressants and I am just in love with life. I mean, I love laughing just like you. And I notice a difference when I don't meditate for a few days in a row or even one day, my mood goes you know, it's, it's not quite as good. You know, I have those moments of joy, but they're not, it's not a constant, like most of the time I'm happy or I can get to a point of being happy really quickly. So is that what you experience as well? Absolutely. And uh, one idea that I really liked um, you in discussing Dr. Joe is that he doesn't talk down to anyone. And one of the very common threads I found among quantum physics and all of spirituality is that the one is the all and the all are the one, whatever all that is, or God or source or whatever you want to call it is. 
it literally is all of us and everything. So when you sit in that seat of consciousness, as I uh, do so to my best of my ability every day, you recognize there's no point to judge or condemn or direct because we're all the same thing. And the ultimate choice that I see in every moment is either love or fear. And fear encompasses every non-preferred emotion, sadness, victimization, judgment, you know, everything that I don't prefer falls in the fear bucket and every emotion that feels good falls in the love bucket. And I kind of see the point to life to realize, wait a minute, we're not a victim of the world. We're creators of our own world and all that needs to happen all in quotes, because it is kind of big and monumental is choosing love in every minute um, over being right, over being heard, over anything else. Um, and I know we talked about this before, and maybe we want to go down that pathway into the definition of love, which I love to discuss, because I spent so many years with a skewed definition of love, and it didn't feel good. And I found a definition that resonates so deeply with me. I love talking about love. So go ahead. Let's hear your definition. And then um, we'll expand upon, on that. Yeah, it was a Eastern philosopher that first got to me and he basically used the synonym allowance or acceptance of as a synonym for love. And it's not so much acceptance from a victimization standpoint, but acceptance from that other perspective we were just talking about as all being the one in recognizing reality is me and whatever perspective I choose on it becomes the experience I have. So if I simply trust people, trust reality, trust all experiences to be happening for my greatest good, since we're all one and all connected, whatever meaning I give to anything is the meaning I get back. So by just allowing things to occur while maintaining a state of peace and potentially um, you know, some type of elevated emotion, if, if that's coming naturally, is really the point of power. Yeah. You know, what that's bringing up for me is you're talking about allowing and I talk quite a bit about projection and what's coming up for me right now in this moment is allowance. When you allow other people to be exactly as they are without trying to fix them, without thinking that you're better than they are or worse than they are, or like they need something, it's really allowing that part of yourself that you've rejected it's a it's bringing it back in and restoring your own wholeness when you're able to allow other people to be as they are you're allowing yourself to be okay as you are and that just like clicked in for you and you're explaining that so i think that's really cool that's and so I, beautiful yeah go ahead i one of the other common threads which i love is the idea that reality is a mirror that there are other souls and entities, all part of the one, of course, but they can, you can only get the version of them that reflects your internal state of being. Um, so it becomes fascinating. And the, the idea of allowance really makes sense in that context for if it's a mirror, if I look at something and say, you're wrong, then whatever I'm, if I'm looking into the mirror and saying, you're wrong, some element of the mirror at some point has to reflect that idea back to me in someone else or some circumstance telling me I'm wrong, making me feel wrong, whatever like that. But if I look at the mirror and say, you're perfect just as you are, because there's just now and whatever meaning I give to the now is what I get back, then reality or the mirror would reflect back you're perfect just as you are. There like is no inherent right or wrong. There simply is the state of consciousness I choose to project outward and then receive backward into me. Yeah. So how has that philosophy affected your relationships? Mm. It's become very interesting, very exciting to be in relationships and made me very appreciative to have people close to me, including my wife, who are able to function as that beautiful mirror. There are times when I and probably everyone else is like, it's just, it'd just be easier to run into a cave and, <laughs> and stay away from everyone because things trigger me. And that's obviously the victimization perspective. When you sit in the seat of being the creator, you can say, thank you for reflecting back to me what I've been putting out. And I get to be the change I wish to see in the world. I don't have to wait for anyone else. You're showing me what I am and I know what I prefer. 
And what we all prefer is the feeling of love and elevated emotions. So it's up to me to show the elevated emotions and love first, acceptance allowance first in every circumstance. Um, sometimes that idea, I think we've talked about it before, the perspective, I kind of see myself as two perspectives. I'm both a human self and then simultaneously like a source self, a higher self. And I flip flop between the two. When you're in the human self, you want to blame another person for it. But when you sit in the higher self perspective, it becomes easy and exciting to look at how things are affecting the human self and then make the change to, to ultimately get that change reflected back to you. Yeah. What, one thing about when you actually accept that you are the creator, then you have the power to change it. If you don't like what you have, choose again. You get you can create whatever you want. Yes. Yes. I think it's, it's so much fun. And I used to resist being a victim so much. I'm like, I am not a victim, blah, blah, blah. And, and, you know, of course I was all the time in my language and somebody always did something that pissed me off. And now uh, like there's some people here that I've coached on the call. And I'll, if I piss people off, what I say is you're welcome. <laughs> and I, I mean, I know it's funny and ridiculous, but I really mean it because if I'm triggering something in someone else, my philosophy is they are ready to heal that part of themselves, the part that they're judging me for, or the part that they think I'm judging them for, because I'm not, I mean, 90% of the time, at least I'm not judging. Sometimes I might be, but they're ready to heal it or they wouldn't see it and they wouldn't be putting it out there on me. So I'm like, the people that trigger me, I'm like, oh, for a moment, I'm like, oh, and then I'm like, okay, what is this for? What are they mirroring back to me? What am I ready to heal? And when I come at it from that perspective, it's not painful anymore. I'm not resisting it. And I'm not angry at this other person. That's beautiful. Um, one, one thing or a couple of things come to mind. One is a Bashar channel by Daryl Anka is one of my other favorite sources. And he recognizes since we're at our root consciousness, not physical beings, we just appear to be looking out from this perspective. The idea that if you don't own every circumstance as your own creation, there's no way for you to fix it because you've disassociated yourself from the creator role. And that's fine. You can choose a victim role and then experience a victim role. And it's perfectly valid just as any other, but it becomes really exciting to take ownership for everything occurring. And then that puts you in the seat of power for your intentionality to really um, have an impact in what you experience going forward. So what do you think the benefit of that is for people like who've never played with this concept? Like I've played with it a lot. Like I am responsible for creating COVID. Okay, what, what did I want? Okay, I wanted some time to go within. I wanted some time to be with my family. Like just, and then peeling that back and globally, what, what did I want? I wanted people to focus on what was really important, like whatever. So what would you say, you know, to somebody who's never embraced these concepts and maybe hearing them for the first time? That, that is so cool, a comment about COVID. Um, I would say to someone who's kind of new or perplexed or whatever, give it a try and find out. That's what I did. I was so freaking bored with the status quo after 40 years of just doing what I'm supposed to be doing in this monotonous cycle that seems to go nowhere except running as fast as you can towards death. And I was like, let's just see what other things I can play with. And obviously playing with the outside didn't really have the effect I was looking for. So the only thing I never played with was what was going on inside me and thoughts and emotions. And my whole world is changing. I've seen people who I never thought would change and just allowed them and decided to be the change completely changed before my eyes. I know it's true. There's not a doubt in my mind and no one's going to convince me otherwise. And, um, going back to big worldwide disasters, I was talking with someone the other day and I don't follow any news media, um, just cause I recognize the emotions that arises in me and it's not the direction I want to go, but they were talking about a recent war. And I said, I'm, I'm completely responsible for that war. And they're like, what? And I'm like, it's a reflection of the war going on within me and my consciousness. I see I created it. I'm responsible for it. And I know exactly what I'm doing now. So we're going to experience heaven on earth within the next 10 years because I totally got this. 
and the person could not could not understand me, but it was my truth. And it kind of ties into what you were talking about before. Sometimes you have to be bold and speak the truth that's thrusting forth from you with no regard for how anyone else perceives it. If if that angers them, but it is my truth. And I know it's the truth that the outside world is reflecting me and I'm excited to speak on it and own it. Um, the boldness I've seen return bigger dividends than anything else. God, I love that. I love all of it. So one thing that I've noticed for me is when I change my insides and I change my paradigm or the lens that I look through. And one of the things that I'm telling my subconscious mind a lot is, okay, show me, show me that people are loving and kind and show me, you know, whatever I want to see. And it's really fascinating how everybody around me changed <laughs> when I changed my perspective. So everybody around me is nice, like everybody. So what is your experience with that, with changing your own perspective? And then the people around you, how do they show up in response to that? I love that term perspective um, or perception. I see them basically synonymous. There's tons of of Eastern philosophies that I've studied that suggest they always like have a quote, something similar along the lines of reality is, is just a perception or just a perspective. And when I first started reading it, I was like, what does that even mean? But now I see, and it's exactly that it, it literally is. It seems like unbelievable because the outside world seems so real, but as I've played with it and, and shifted perspective and chose to see the the characteristics and other people that I appreciate most I've watched and, and just allowed them to be, they don't need to change. I'm going to see you that way. People who I thought were so deeply rooted in, in their thought patterns completely changed in a way that I think is more loving towards themselves. Mm. Yeah. That's really beautiful. I love that. Yeah. What do you want to talk about now, John? Oh, there's so many, so many different directions we could go. Um, let's go back to love. Yeah. Love, love. Let's yes. talk about love. So yes. it's really fascinating. Like we talked about, uh, sometimes we talk about a course in miracles mm. and the, the premise that anytime someone is behaving, it's either an extension of love or speaking or a cry for love. Like, I don't feel loved. I don't feel lovable. Love me. And so they're, they might engage in some attacking words or behaviors, or maybe somebody has the capacity to love them. So can you expand on that concept a bit? Definitely. And it's, uh, I, I've spent a bunch of time looking at that and realizing in myself, every time I'm angry or fearful or upset, it it's a cry for love from me in, in being honest with myself. So if, if I'm one idea of humanity, it stands to reason everyone else would be coming from that same perspective. And uh, it's, it's interesting to look like the maybe American philosophy is like we have a war machine to maintain safety and peace here. And as I sit with ideas like that, I realize the irony in the idea that war or building war machines can result in peace what you put out is what you get back. What you focus on is what you create. So the idea of needing to protect or needing to war to maintain peace is, it seems like an oxymoron or a paradox. The only thing that can cause peace is peace. So the only response to anger or, or fear would be love. That would be the only thing that would dissolve it. And going back to our previous definition, love would be allowance in saying you do you like I I'm going to choose what I'm going to take part in, but I'm going to allow everything to transpire. Uh, there's a guy, Michael Singer, who I like a lot. And when he speaks about how to navigate reality, he, he poses a great question in one of his videos. He's like, what's the one thing you've never done in response to a problem or someone aggravating you or whatever? And he goes, it's nothing. You've never done nothing in response to something, nothing in physical action and nothing in your mind. Can you just sit in stillness feel the anger rise up in you and just sit at a point of neutrality. And he calls it usually like a wave, just let the wave of anger or the wave of the experience pass over you and allow it to be. Um, and it makes so much sense that hit me so hard. And I spent a lot of time sitting in that. Can I just sit 
all day as things arise and, and kind of float over them and do nothing in response to them. And it does seem to dissipate the energy associated with it. Because as Dr. Joe says, where awareness goes, energy flows. Uh, Abraham Hicks says, what you focus on expands. Everyone suggests the idea that basically there's only a gas pedal. You can only like press the gas, whether you're screaming, no, yes, go away, come, whatever you're screaming at something. If you're looking at it, you're calling more of it to you. So it would make perfect sense. The only way to actually let something go would be to literally do nothing about it, have no emotional or physical reaction to it and just let it float over and then resume your focus on whatever it is that, that you're excited to attract more of. Yeah, I, I love all that. And it reminds me of, in course, in a course of Miracles, like all events are neutral and it's just the meaning that we assign the events that gives us a charge. And it's really fascinating. You and I talked about this, but certain things I'm really super chill. I can get there really easily. If it has to do with strangers, for example, I have the capacity to love almost anyone, especially if it's a stranger. But if it's somebody close to me and they do something that like my child that triggers me, it's like, it's so different and it becomes disconnected in my brain. Like how can I have the capacity to love a stranger? And then I can snap at my own child. So, <laughs> so what do you think about that, John? Hmm. Yeah, the, the relationships that are closest to us seem to be our greatest gifts in that I see, since I see reality as a mirror, I see almost everyone as a mirror and the mirrors that are closer to you are the ones that are going to reflect brighter and stronger and bigger than the ones that are further away. And that's why I'm so appreciative to have a partner who's interested in exploring the idea of consciousness with me because I get to have a mirror up close uh, who's potentially sharing a similar paradigm idea that the real expansion occurs within and changing within rather than trying to change things outside. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And I'm going to answer my own question because I, I said it earlier. It's like, my child can do nothing to trigger me. What's triggering me is the meaning that I'm giving to whatever they're doing or saying, right? Yes. So, and what often happens if I do get triggered is I will... I will go inside and I will reflect and I'm like, okay, I know that they don't have the capacity to make me mad. That is my power that's <laughs> within me. So what is it triggering in me? What is it showing me that I think is unacceptable about me? And then I will go have a conversation and say, hey, you didn't deserve that. There's nothing wrong with you. You do not have the power to make me mad. That's all on me. And I think it's really beautiful to have these conversations with people, whether they're our children or our spouse or our friends, where we actually own and our part and be responsible for creating the discord. Even if we think someone did something to us, to completely own it is such a beautiful gift for everybody. And you and I have talked about forgiveness, so we can go there next. Let's talk a little bit about forgiveness. What's the definition that you love? Yes. I, and I want to say I'm excited to get into forgiveness, but I want to say I think that's beautiful, a beautiful experience to share with your child for two reasons. One, you recognize I'm the creator of my own reality and I chose that definition so I can change that definition. And simultaneously, you you uh, share an idea with with your child that they they're perfect just as they are. Uh, and shouldn't be afraid to express themselves in whatever way because everyone's responsible for themselves. So I, I see it empowering for both people within. Um, and I love Bashar's uh, definition of reality where he says reality is meaningless. Everything is a meaningless prop. The gift you were given by the creator was to be the one empowered to assign meaning or definitions to everything. So it it's it's super empowering and it ties into forgiveness in the idea. Um, the Course in Miracles is one of my favorite sources pertaining to forgiveness because as I best understand the course, um, it suggests basically forgetting is the best synonym for forgiveness. And a lot of Eastern Proverbs talk about the idea of dying to every second. And the first time I heard that, I didn't get it, but it seems like the same idea. Can you approach every person, every circumstance, 
every day at work, every everything, no matter how many times you think you've interacted with that person and just let all the memories go, bring the state of being you prefer into the situation, like being the change you wish to see and experiencing what plays out um, in that circumstance. It's so beautiful and, and definitely something to aspire to. <laughs> I always talk about like, well, I'm not quite there yet all the time or even 50% of the time, but you know, it's something to aspire to. I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah. The topic of memory, which is obviously strongly associated with forgiveness fascinates me because if we go back to the starting idea that there's only now and every now is a separate film strip, Bashar suggests memory is created in the present moment because every potential exists in every second as quantum physics proves, then there would be no one the history or one the future. The history and the future is an infinite palette of the exact same infinite number of film strip frames to choose from. So the overall concept is my present state of being dictates my memories. And I found that to be true when I'm in a very happy mood, I'll look back at one event and be like, oh, it's okay. You know, I lost a thousand dollars. Who cares? More money is going to come. But I'll be in an angry mood and I'll think back on that same event. And all of a sudden, it's going to be a whole different set of emotions and like literally a different memory. And that's when I realized memory is not, memory is actually a reliable indicator of the state of being I'm at right now, but it's not an objective view of the past because there couldn't be such a thing as objectivity when everything is subjective based on my perspective. Oh, that's beautiful. I love it all. Well, this has been amazing. Is there any last things you want to share with the viewers before we wrap up? The the idea I sit with the most now and resonates most deeply with me. Again, if there's only now, I am I choose the perspective that myself and every person and everything in this world is absolutely perfect just as it is right now. That's the intention I set towards the mirror to receive that reflection back and experience it um, because every now is a completely new now and starting right now, I choose that perspective and I appreciate everyone being here and, and love you all. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much, John. And thank you everybody for being here and for watching. Join us right here next week. Don't leave if you're in the audience. <laughs> <laughs>